A little bit about me. My name's Teresa Goodrich. I'm the founder and publisher of The Local Tourist. It's I'm getting ready to celebrate my 20th, 21st year. My site is almost old enough to drink. Uh, that will be in February of 20 of next year. Um, will be my 21st year as a local tourist. I also have a site called the Your Chicago Guide. I'm an author and an Emmy winner. I have uh, multiple books under my belt. And one of my favorites is uh, Living Landmarks of Chicago. And I'm pointing this one out specifically because I did a ton of research. And because I wrote most of this when, during lockdowns, I couldn't go to the library to do any research or go to the Chicago His History Museum or any of those resources or, or Newberry. I had to do it all online and all from home. So I got to be pretty good at, at finding out all these little nuggets of information and getting to the original source and these primary sources. Um, so uh, that's enough about me because you want to learn about these tools. Oh, here's Amy. I'm going to admit her. Hi, Amy. <laughs> okay, she's coming in. Great. And Amy, I had mentioned earlier that I did get your question and we'll, I'm gonna go through the tools first. And then at the end, I'm going to uh, go into what I was able to find. I just did some really quick searches for both you and for Lori, and you can see uh, how the <clears throat> tools that I use to find that information. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna go through, I've got this uh, by eight, digital research tools that I, I tend to use, I tend to start off with. The first one is my local library. And let me share my screen here. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. 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 Awesome, okay. So the your local library, uh, most likely has tons of online digital resources as well. Now, I used to live in Chicago, and as you can imagine, their library is um, a just fantastic quantity of resources. But surprisingly, I live in a northwest suburb of Chicago. It's, it's a much less populated area, and yet we still have a ton of online resources. So um, it's Algonquin Area Public Library, and I just went to Virtual Library, and then you can see all of these different resources that are available. Some are only available if I physically go to the library. Some like the ones with the green background and an O, those are available for anybody. Others, you need to have uh, your library card number to be able to use that. So let's see, I'm looking at Chicago Tribune 1849 to 1998. If I were to click on that, then it's going to take me someplace where I have to put in my library card number. But your library is a good place to start. And then if you have specific questions too, librarians are your best friend. Um, and speaking of library, another one is the Library of Congress. Now this, because it's a Library of Congress, it's owned by the people, so everything is free. And you can find, it says everything here, but uh, you can find audio recordings, books, printed material, films, videos. I often use it to find maps and <clears throat> photos. Um, so for example, uh, in Living Landmarks, I was writing about the auditorium building. So I can just type in auditorium building and search for it and it'll bring up any results. So let's say auditorium building, I'll click through to that. This was a design by Lewis Sullivan. It's one of the historic landmarks in Chicago. And look, it's got 120 images. So you can see what the auditorium building looks like. And this was, these were taken back in, I have to remember the date. Um, I think they, these were in the early 1900s. But down here, you can see the rights and access so that if you use any of the photos that you find on the Library of Congress, that there's information at the bottom that uh, shows you how to cite where you found that information because uh, making sure you cite it is important. But if you're writing a story about an historic building, I mean, or uh, you can start by searching through the Library of Congress and see what they have available. Um, now, definitely places like Chicago, you're going to find more results or New York or some of the bigger cities, but you can also find, uh, you'd be surprised at the, the information that's out there. But let's say you're writing, uh, 
I was telling the story of how this building came to be and I can see like the inner workings of it literally. So that's another really cool resource. And then if you want to download those, then you can just click on one of the photos and it'll take you to an individual page where you can then download it. So that's a great resource. Um, also from the Library of Congress is uh, Chronicling America. This is, they have digitized newspapers from 1777 to 1963. So this is a fantastic place to find original primary in source information. For example, when I was researching the Palmer House Hilton, there's this legend that the Palmer House uh, was built and then burned. Uh, it, it was built 13 days or opened 13 days before the Great Chicago Fire. Now, it was a wedding gift from Potter Palmer to his wife, uh, Bertha Palmer. And now that part is true. It was a wedding gift. However, by searching through Chronicling America, and I wasn't trying to debunk any myths or anything. I was just trying to get information on the opening. I found it had actually opened up in 1870, not 1871. So it had been open for a year and 13 days prior to the Great Chicago Fire, not 13 days. So while it's still a tragedy and there's still that the romance attached to it because it was a wedding gift, it wasn't as dramatic as 13 days. And however, this is something that is still on Palmer House's website. They, and, and But they know, I mean, th this is, I'm not the first person to find this information. I think back in the 70s, there was an article, I believe, in the Chicago Tribune about this or and through the Chicago History Museum. But if you are looking for historical information, this is fantastic. Now, their search function is a little wonky. It's, it can be hard to use, but uh, you can do an advanced search. So you can see on the left here, we've got all the states. You can specify which states you want to look through. Uh, the specific newspapers. Let's say that you know there's a story that was published in the Anderson Daily Intelligence or in Anderson, South Carolina. You can select spe that newspaper specifically, and then you can uh, pick a date range. Now, let's say you know that somebody got married or died on a certain day, or there was something significant that happened on a specific date, then you can choose that date and maybe, maybe if a few days afterwards and see what um, what the newspapers at the time had to say about it. There, uh, the results um, will, well, let's see, they've got here 100 years ago today, but let's just, I'm just gonna plug in Palmer House. And I'm gonna, oh, except I've already picked Anderson, South Carolina. So, oh, and look. Palmer or house. That is something to be careful of with this search result. Like I said, it's a little wonky. So you have to be aware if you're wanting to look for all the keywords, some of the keywords, uh, or either or keywords. Um, when the results come up, they'll be highlighted and you can see the, the pink highlights on the various newspapers. And I apologize, my internet's a little slow. I'm just happy I've got it with the way the weather is right now. Um, <laughs> Once you get to a newspaper, then it'll highlight where those words appear on the page. And you can zoom in if you'd like. And if you want to save this information, then you can save it as a text, a PDF, or a JPEG. And when you do that, I'd also recommend using some kind of Chrome extension, a web clipper. My personal favorite is Evernote because that way, all the information that you are going to want to cite, uh, or if you want to find this information again, is not going to be in the download. It'll be in the PDF, but it won't be in the text and may not be in the JPEG. So you'll also want to kind of bookmark uh, this page, this search result in something like Evernote. Okay. Now. Are there any, I'm gonna open, look at, check the chat. Are there any questions about the, those sources so far? Mm. Okay. Uh, another favorite resource for me, is historical marker database. And uh, this is fun. They've got like nearly 200,000 markers, I believe in their database now. But this is a database of all the historical markers. Now I'm the kind of person that wants to pull over at any single marker that I see. 
Um, and I, they are just, they provide a lot of interesting information. Uh, for example, and I'm going to search for this because I hadn't. Um, there have been historical markers in around the, the Michigan Avenue Bridge, now the DeSable Bridge in downtown Chicago. And over the years, those historical markers had changed. And it's not going to show me on, on this one. I, I would have to, I did not check that search ahead of time to see if it would work. Um, but here, oh, here we go. Catherine and Jean Baptiste Point du Sable, uh, fur traders. So I can, that's one of those, it's downtown Chicago. And once you click through to a listing, it'll show you what the historical marker is. There's a picture, there's a description, whether whatever the inscription is, as well as audio, if you want to listen to it. Uh, the different topics, and as you can see, they organize a lot, all of these historical markers into various topics. Um, the exact location, lot of latitude and longitude, and then there's also a map. Uh, one thing that is really, really cool about this is that you can search for historical markers near you, or you can put in a specific location. So if I just do the map of nearest uh, 100, and I'm going to do that. Uh, so I can show you how many come up just near me. So if I want to start, you know, get, I had no idea before this tool that there were this many historical markers that were close to me. And it, shortly after we moved here, I discovered one that was of the Goodrich family homestead. And it's about, uh, I think, maybe six miles from here, from our home. And my name is Teresa Goodrich found out that that Goodrich family homestead was related to it, part of my husband's family. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> uh, let's see, we'll just Veterans Memorial. Let's see, what's in Wakanda? Andrew C. Cookhouse. And so you can just kind of explore what's around you. If you're looking, if you're writing about a specific place, this could come in handy because you can then see what uh, the historical markers are. And because many of them were, you know, were set up years ago, the stories can change uh, as people learn more, verify more information. It's also interesting to see what kind of information is presented and the language that's used when they're presenting it. So. Okay, now the next tool that I really enjoy using, and it might seem a little morbid, but it's a find a grave, findagrave.com. This is a great resource to find more genealogical information. So if you're writing about a particular person, then you can search for their grave and see what kind of information comes up. Now, I'm just going to plug in Marshall Field. You can plug in the year they were born, the year they were died, if you know that location, first, uh, middle, and last. And now I know. Marshall Field died in 1906. You can see there are quite a few. So it helps to know a little bit about the person you're looking for. So find him. He is a, considered a, um, an important historical person. Uh, so that's why they have the, this indicator right here, the star. But this is where he was born, when he died, where he's buried, including the plot number. But what's interesting about this too is that there's usually biographical information, not always, but you can sometimes find biographical information. And then you can also see his par their uh, person's parents, siblings, spouses, and children. So if you wanna get some more information, that's where you could find out maybe if you are trying to do a story about Mrs. Field, then you can find more information about her based on her maiden name. Because typically in stories, especially in the 1800s and early 1900s, women did not get the dignity of their names. They were just Mrs. Whoever. And usually they were called like Mrs. Marshall Field. It wasn't even Mrs. Uh, Nanny Field. So this is one way to, to get a little more information about them. Um, all of these are just rabbit holes. It's like you're pulling a thread and you just follow that thread to where it leads you. And Jeff is a treasure hunter. You know exactly what that's all about, right? <laughs> I know, I know. Yep. Um, Another resource that I use is the Genealogy Center. Now, this is based out of the Public Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's the second largest genealogy center in the United States outside of the Mormons in Salt Lake City. 
And they have, well, if you can't get to Fort Wayne, they have online resources. And so if you just go to explore genealogy and click on that link, then uh, you go to about our, our databases and the free databases, and they've got a list of them. Uh, other states resources, this is a good place to start for military heritage. They've got a lot of military heritage databases. Um, and you can also search, they've got a search at the top for search our free databases too, just to, you know, as a starting point. Um, they also have librarians on staff that are happy to help. Now this next one, and I know, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay, Sarah. She said her video is off. Um, so this Hathi Trust is one of my absolute favorite rabbit hole research tools. I mean, it's just, it's, I love it. Um, it is a, a free resource. They have, I think, something like 17 million records that uh, have been digitized or 17 million pages or something. I mean, everything from sheet music to old cookbooks and recipes to annual reports for places like uh, Lincoln Park. And um, I mean, I was able to find a ton of information recently. I visited a town called Marinette, Wisconsin, and I found a lot of information through Hathi Trust. Now, when you first visit it, I'm gonna go ahead and log out and then I'll log back in. You do not need to log in. Uh, you can search this oh, just, I mean, you can just go to hathitrust.org. It's H-A-T-H-I-T-R-U-S-T.org. Um, and you can use it for free. You don't have to log in at all. But even if you do log in, then it's also for free. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and log in now. You can choose a partner institution. Those are mainly universities. I'm not affiliated with any university, so I can see options to log in as a guest. And you can log in with Google, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Microsoft. So I'm gonna go ahead and do Google. That's how I usually log in. Dude. Come on. <laughs> Sorry, my connection is a little slow. I'm even I'm plugged into the ethernet. Okay, so the, the reason you would wanna log in, um, and even though as a guest, so this means that every time I come back to Happy Trust, I have to log in again, but it's really not that much of an inconvenience. But the reason you wanna log in is because you can create what are called collections. And this is, I use this extensively when I was researching living landmarks. I use it now a lot whenever I'm trying to get more detailed information about a place. So I'm gonna mention, I had written this story about Marinette, Wisconsin. And in it, so I, I referenced these sources claim that both Jacobs and Farnworth left her, but Gustav William Bushen claims in Historic Sheboygan County, published in 1944, that she left them. So I was able to get, you know, round out the story of this woman who was called Queen Marinette to the town and the county is named for. And I found the information by searching for Queen Marinette in Hathi Trust. And when I did that, it brought up uh, these different resources and we'll go through a couple of them real quickly. So the one I just mentioned, Historic Sheboygan County, that's where I found the reference to uh, Queen Marinette and uh, the story that maybe her husbands didn't leave her, she actually left them, which I thought was a fun little twist. When you're searching, you always want to make sure that you're searching for full text and not just catalog. If you search for catalog, then you're only going to get the catalog listing. You won't be able to actually search the test text. So I'll go ahead and open this in a new window or new tab. You can see it was published in 1944. I've got other uh, resources here, Recollections of a Long Life. Uh, this is published in 1915. It's the autobiography of Isaac Stevenson. He was one of the founding fathers of Marinette. Uh, souvenir of Marinette, Wisconsin. So you can really see, especially as a travel writer, and if you want to bring a place to life, then and understand how it came to be the way it is, then if you start here and find these historical resources, then you can really round out your piece. It is also a rabbit hole, which is why I'm calling this a research rabbit holes. Because you could, I mean, unless you're writing a history of Marinette, you could get 
you know, caught up a little bit. So I do advise having something specific for which you're searching. So this is what it looks like once you open a record. You can also view it by thumbnails. I will often do that if I'm looking for uh, an image that I might wanna use in, in my post, uh, if it's in a public domain piece. Um, so like that image right there, although this is published in 1944, so this isn't in public domain, so I probably wouldn't use that, but that's the author of this particular book. So I'm going to just put over here in the search, Queen Marinette. Teresa, how many years back does it have to be before it's considered public domain? I believe it's, oh, Jim, do you know? Um, I mean, I think 1925 right now is... 1925 and before is in public domain, but I'm not absolutely positive. Um, okay. That's true for music, but I'm not sure about the rest of print. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm pretty, well, then I think it's if for music and it's the same for uh, copyright in general. Uh, it's, they release new, like every year, there's a new release of items that are in the public domain. Um, okay. So why, okay, so over on the left-hand side, you'll see now the search results, the city and county of Marinette, you can see Queen Marinette. When you search in uh, using this function here, if you don't put in quotation marks, then it's going to show you pages where both of those, any, all of the words that are in your search phrase are have to be on that page. So I'm gonna go back to, let's see. We'll go search. We're just going to show this result. And that's page 93. Or number 93. The number and the pages are different. But then once you open up the page, then it will it's highlighted just like it was on chroniclingamerica.com. It shows you where in there. So you don't have to search through the entire text. Then if you want to save it, you can let's go down here. Um, Download, I'm sorry, download up here. Some of the publications in Hathi Trust, you can download the entire book. And I've got a collection of download whole book that I just saved. So that way I might save it in one collection. Like maybe I'll save it in, his, in Wisconsin history. And then if I can download the whole book, then I would save it also in download whole book. So that way I know I can come back later. And if I want the entire book to read at my leisure, I can download it at any time. But most, most of the publications, you can only download one page at a time. So we've got, you can download P PDF, text, JPEG, or TIFF, um, and then download it. That way you can save it. The, I had done a piece on, let's see, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. It's actually an excerpt from Living Landmarks. And I found some historic photos of Symphony Center, found those in Hathi Trust and publications in there. And then I was able to download them and crop them, you know, save them as JPEGs and use them to round out my piece so that people could see what it really looked like, you know, when they first opened the uh, Symphony Center back in 1904. Okay. Um, to add to a collection, you just click on collections and then you can click the down arrow or if you've already got different collections you've created or you can just click new collection, add, and then you can give it a collection name and a description. And then you can choose to make it private or public. Let's say you wanna share your research with other people or maybe you wanna become known as somebody who is uh, a, a skilled researcher in a certain topic, then you can make it public and share it with other people. Okay. Um, so that's, whew, time is flying. I want to get to Amy and Lori's stuff. So the next tool I'm going to go into, okay, yeah, we've got 10 minutes, so I'm going to go quickly. Um, Newspapers.com, this is a fantastic resource. This is the only one of all of the ones I'm showing you that is a paid resource. You can probably access it through your library. It's just more of a pain because you have to enter your library card every single time you log in. I went ahead to, and got a membership because I use this so much, it's about $75 for six months. Um, 
these have, as you can see, 818,971,879 total newspaper pages. That is as of today. They are adding more newspapers and adding more pages all the time. Um, as you can see, I, uh, Lori, I've done some searches on here for the, your topic that you were looking for. And unfortunately, I wasn't really able to find much. I did find something that we'll go into in a minute. Uh, but I was also using newspapers.com to research my piece about Marinette, Wisconsin. And when you find something, so you could just put in a keyword in a location. And I'm just going to go to Vaughn. I guess I could have just. And you definitely want to use quotation marks on this site when you're searching for something, because if you don't, then it would show every single newspaper page that included the word Vaughn. <laughs> so as you can imagine, that could get quite unwieldy. All right, now Lori is doing a piece or wants to do a piece on Marie von, um, I don't know how to pronounce that, Brunschenhain. Um, so she wanted to see if we could find more information about him. I'd originally searched for Eugene von, uh, von B, we'll just go with von B so I don't butcher it. And I wasn't seeing a whole lot. I mean, this one did bring up 1,168 matches, but it's not just the specific one we're looking for. So that's why when you, you can put in a state like Wisconsin and I can see, okay, this one is from Green Bay. And I can see from the clip that it is about Eugene, um, but it didn't show up in the search results because Eugene is hyphenated. So this is one where you just kind of have to keep playing around and uh, just you know, keep digging through, you know, keep pulling that thread. Uh, I tend to usually sort from the oldest paper date to the newest, because that way, if I, I can see when the first reference for something was, this is from Florida. So these aren't going to be relevant for me, but I'm going to go to this specific article. And it'll, it will also show the words highlighted where that the phrase that I searched for up here. And I did find a little reference of Marie Laurie here, but this was about it. There really wasn't anything else, but there's a photo of her. So this is something, you know, you could, you can search for that later if you'd like. And uh, if you want to include that photo of her, you might be able to, although it's from 1984. So you might not, it just depends on um, if you, cite it properly. Uh, once you find an article, then you can clip it. So you can just do clip and you can drag and drop mm. and then you can create a title. You can choose to save it so that it's visible to everybody or that you can be the, it's only saved for your clippings. Um, there we go. Okay. Now let's see, I'm gonna go quickly through my clippings. hopefully quickly. <laughs> okay. And you can see I've saved all these different clippings. Like when I was doing an article about Lake Geneva, one of the things I kept hearing was a new port of the West. So I got these references from 1888 calling Lake Geneva, the new port of the West uh, reference about the Riviera, which is a building that's still in existence. It's a, and in Lake Geneva, it's on the national register of historic places. And um, that is from 1946. So I can, could include that ad in my article if I wanted to. More information about Queen Marinette and about Isaac Stevenson. And I've also, I mean, I've used it to, for the opening of the Pikes Peak Cog Railway. I did a piece on that and I was able to find information about when that was added. Seven Falls, the Broadmoor Seven Falls, which is a, an attraction in Colorado Springs. There was an article about when they installed the floodlights for the uh, first time. So then you can nail down the dates. So you can really in, uh, find out exactly when something happened because there's an article about it and you've got the receipts as the kids like to say. Now I'm gonna very quickly go into what I found for Amy. Amy is searching for the Cartier Bed and Breakfast. It's located in Ludington, Michigan. So I started that with a basic Google search. Uh, this is usually how I start my research. And if the time, 
Okay, we've got four minutes, so <laughs> I'll keep going. And if you have any questions that you want to ask or need something clarified, email me at tlc at the local tourist.com and I'll be happy to answer you. Okay, so I searched for Cartier Mansion, Ludington, Michigan, National Register of Historic Places. Came up automatically because I'd already searched for it. Now, I searched specifically for that because through my research from Living Landmarks of Chicago, I know that the National Register of Historic Places are uh, just treasure troves of information, generally speaking. So I searched for that and I was able to find this Cartier, William A. and Catherine, or Cartier, I believe is how it's pronounced. It is Cartier. Yes. And it, yeah. And, the, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> they, <laughs> okay. they don't want to conflict with Cartier. Ah. And so to kind of not conflict, mm -hmm. they chose to pronounce it that way. But okay. they do associate with, with Jacques Cartier. Okay. Well, we've Cartier. only got three minutes. So I'm going to go through this real quick. Sorry. It's okay. Okay, so I was able to find the application form for the National Register of Historic Places or the registration form. So, Amy, I, I can I will send you this link. I made some notes of it, and it will have Thank information you. about the house and the property. Oh, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, Lori, I had done a search for, now, I don't know if you had found this, but Marie Vaughn. So usually, I mean, start with Google first. That's a great way to, um, sometimes it can be frustrating, but I came across this article where it talks about her, Marie's real name was actually Evelyn Teresa Kalki. Her name was Evelyn and her husband decided to start calling her Marie after they got married. And so there's more information through here. I don't know if, have you, did you see this? I did see that. Okay. Yeah, okay. that was really, yeah. So I have her original name, but okay. yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. And I started searching through newspapers.com for her, but you know, and there really wasn't much information on him either in newspapers or in Happy Trust. I did. Okay. Going back to Cartier, um, Wikipedia is actually another source that I start with. And before you scoff or I lose you, it's if you go all the way down to the bottom and the resources. So with Wikipedia, because it's user-generated crowdsourced, um, you have to make sure that you get, you verify any information you find there, but usually at the very bottom, then you can find information and resources or like finding out um, Catherine um, Cartier's maiden name. It's Kate, we, on the website, they call her Kate Cartier, but her name was Catherine Dempsey was her maiden name. So then mm -hmm. you can start searching for more information through Catherine Dempsey. Maybe you can look for a uh, wedding announcement or obituaries. Um, when you're searching for, especially for women, you can search for Mrs. and their husband's last name or their Mrs. and their husband's first and last name in addition to looking for their maiden name. And if you can find any obituaries, that'll usually give more family information as well. I did find information on her in Find a Grave 2. Uh, their marriage announcement from May 1888 was in newspapers.com. And yeah, in Happy Trust, I did find the National Endowment for the Arts for the John Michael Kohler Arts Center, uh, their grant that they got back in the, I think it was 1984. So Zoom's going to kick us out. I apologize. I hope this was helpful. Like I said, please yeah. send me any questions that you've got. <laughs> Thank you. And Thank you. This is here. great for me. Awesome. Awesome. And I can see who's here. So there are, let's see, one, two, three, four, five of you. Sorry, Jim, you, you don't get the scholarship. So I'll do a random.org and pick somebody to get the scholarship for the travel writing mastery. 